Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Casual Audio Readings. Today we are continuing in this paper, uh, Implications for Educational Practice of the Science of Learning and Development. Uh, today I was actually just reading one of the papers in another uh, one of those bundles and it was just really interesting. I can't really... I can't wait to get to those in this sort of stuff, but good things come to those who wait. So let's continue. School and classroom communities that offer safe, personalized settings for learning. Learning is a transactional process in which both students and teachers learn how to understand and communicate with each other and in which trust creates conditions for reduced anxiety, as well as greater striving and motivation. Research suggests that relationships are most beneficial when they are attuned to children's emotional needs, when they are consistent and over time, and when they support children's cognitive engagement. Practices reflecting these principles are well represented in schools that are successful with students who are typically marginalized and underserved. These include the development of an intentional community that ensures a sense of belonging and safety with shared norms represented in all of the school's activities. In addition, a culture of Participation encourages student agency and leadership in the context of a culturally responsive curriculum that values diverse experiences. Educative and restorative practices teach students responsibility and allow them to exercise it in contributing, in contributing to the school and local community. It's really interesting. Pretty much all of these are especially beneficial for for marginalized and underserved children and children of those communities. I'm really curious as to why that is. Like why what best serves the non-marginalized communities? Is it that Based on what I was talking about yesterday, is it that they are just not in need? So they're already high achievers, for instance, or is it that we're just not studying them? I'm not sure. Classroom design and management. In developmentally grounded schools, classroom management is approached as something that is done with students and not to them. Productive classrooms are organized not around a compliance regimen that emphasizes the recognition and punishment of misbehavior, but on the promotion of student responsibility through the development of common norms and routines with the participation of students. Students may help develop the classroom rules and norms, often in a classroom constitution that is posted and take on specific tasks ranging from materials, manager, or librarian, to leading activities in the classroom, to, organ to organizing special events, which allow them to be responsible and contributing members of the community. An effective classroom learning community develops respectful relationships between teachers and students, and also among the students themselves, as students are taught to develop social competence, Teachers take time to socialize students to their roles as community members. Teachers and students together create common norms for, for how to behave in various situations so that students can learn how to interact respectfully, take turns, voice their needs and thoughts appropriately, and solve problems that occur. The teacher's active role in co-regulating children's behavior helps scaffold the child's development towards self-regulation by providing them with a repertoire of words and strategies to use to manage different situations. A recent meta-analysis of 54 classroom management programs found that while all of the approaches had modest positive effects, 
overall ES equals um, 0.22. Don't know what ES stands for. The interventions focused on the social emotional development of students. The interventions focused on the social emotional development of students were the most effective. One well researched example of such a developmentally grounded approach is consistency management and cooperative discipline, which builds shared responsibility for learning and classroom organization between teachers and students. The teacher creates a consistent learning environment by working with students in establishing a cooperative plan for classroom rules, procedures, use of time, and academic learning that governs the classroom. Students become citizens of the classroom as they create a constitution and take responsibility for the dozens of activities in the classroom that teachers might otherwise do themselves. As they are taught citizenship skills and given multiple chances for leadership, students gain the experiences necessary to become self-disciplined. All adults in the school learn to work with children in consistent ways, and home community involvement is encouraged. In a set of, in a set of evaluations in urban school in urban public schools, researchers found increases in student and teacher attendance, a reduction in discipline referrals, and improvements in classroom climate, time to learn, and long-term student achievement. The development of a classroom learning community helps teachers to manage the classroom, both because children feel more connected and because peers often uh, offer greater assistance and collaboration, gaining in competence and agency. Developing community practices that strengthen relationships is critical. These practices may include classroom meetings, check-ins about how students are doing at the beginning of class, and routines for how to work in groups productively, engage in respectful discussions, or resolve conflicts. They may also include regular student-teacher conferences. In collaborative communities, members feel personally connected to one another and committed to each other's growth and learning. Identity-safe environments. As we have noted, healthy development and learning requires both physical and psychological safety. One aspect of this safety is protection from physical bullying or trauma, accomplished by explicitly teaching students how to interact with each other and addressing challenges immediately. Equally important is, the teachers, uh, is that cr teachers create environments where students are affirmed and equitably supported. Teachers play a key role in shaping student learning through their own beliefs and the feedback they provide to their students. Their perceptions of students shape expectations that often predict student achievement apart from prior ability. Unfortunately, there is evidence that many teachers attribute inaccurate characterizations of academic ability and behavior to students based on race and ethnicity. On average, teachers have lower expectations of Black and Latino students and, and interact with them less positively than white students. They are more likely to label Black students as troublemakers, punishing them more harshly for the same offenses, while the vast majority of teachers enter the profession with a passion for fostering children's learning, growth, and development, implicit bias can nonetheless color how they interact with their students. This type of bias can lead to negative expectations, which often triggers the behaviors that teachers want to avoid. The way students are treated in school can trigger social identity threats if they feel they are at risk of being stigmatized by characteristics such as race, language background, economic background, gender, or other traits. Social identity threat uh, leads to significant stress, release of cortisol and adrenaline, symptoms of anxiety and depression, and sometimes challenging behavior that results from an attempt to protect one's identity from perceived attack. If students come to expect bias, this expectation also influences their behavior. Now, the interesting thing here is this, when was this? 
2019. That's actually um, the same year that this other paper that I read recently uh, was published called The Six Lessons Regarding Implicit Bias That Need to Be Addressed. And it's basically outlining six problems with the assumptions of implicit bias, though not in a um, an antithetical way. The article is, I found it on SagePub. Uh, it's also open access, so anybody can um, access it. And it's um, in the journal Perspectives on Psychological Science. And one of the, oh, let me, uh, the article is called Six Lessons for a Cogent Science of Implicit Bias and Its Criticism. And it's just important because whenever we um, talk about things that are more or less uh, golden child, golden children of the social sciences, you really want to understand where the criticism is coming from on that respect. And this one is actually really important because um, lesson one says that there is no evidence that people are unaware of the mental contents underlying their implicit biases. Not saying that implicit bias is like not really a thing, but it is to some degree because it's saying um, implicit bias implies that you don't know what your biases are. Implicit meaning it's unconscious. And so if you don't know what your biases are, then you are apt to continue to operate within them because you have no idea how to counteract them. But one of the issues is none of the literature really suggests that people don't know what their biases are. And a lot of what you normally see in those studies is they'll compare, for instance, apples to oranges, where you're talking about, let's say, um, specific things that people are doing versus uh, opinions of beauty, for instance. So an apple to orange comparison would be, do you find this person attractive? No. Would you hire this person? No or yes. That would be an apples to orange, oranges comparison. Or do you find this random dark skull, uh, dark skin colored, dark wait, dark skinned person to be more of a threat? Do you associate this person with the word threat or gun or whatever versus this other person? That's one um, apples comparison. But then you uh, talk about biases in the workplace or um, in communicating with people in any sort of social interaction, that'd be an oranges comparison. So you're comparing actually two different realms of um, behavior. And one of the problems is that, well, that's one of the problems. And another problem is you sort of extrapolate from that and draw, uh, ev draw conclusions that people don't know where their biases are, but the evidence from from the um, literature is that people actually do know what their biases are. And so it sort of questions whether or not implicit bias is a pervasive thing. Now, when you have something like implicit biases in these uh, uh, characterizations of academic ability and behavior, I'm actually going to want to look more into those because those are studies from more than a decade earlier and so it'll just be really interesting some questions would be are these comparing schools from white neighborhoods versus black neighborhoods are they comparing schools with a generally 50 50 percentage of students are they comparing multiple schools to each other, and how are they drawing those through lines, etc.? But although I question the potency of this claim, I don't really question the validity of the claim. It seems like something that would generally be 
something you'd expect, but I don't know. I want to look into these papers. Teachers need to understand how their attitudes toward their students can shape their treatment of students and what students ultimately learn. Affirming attitudes that convey confidence in students' abilities, for example, have been shown to support students' achievement and to counteract stereotype threat uh, and to counteract stereotype threat, the social identity threat that that occurs when someone fears being judged in terms of a group-based stereotype. When triggered, stereotype threat induces stress and reduces uh, and reduction. Wait. When triggered, stereotype threat induces stress and reduction in work memory and focus leading to impaired performance. Stereotype threat can be mitigated by how teachers frame the purpose of assignments and assessments as diagnosing current skills that can be improved rather than measuring ability, and by now how they give constructive feedback to students about their work. Noting that the feedback reflects the teacher's high standards and a conviction that the student can reach them, along with an opportunity to revise the work. When the threat is lifted through affirmations that the student is seen as competent and valued, many dozens of studies have shown that performance on tests, grades, and other academic measures improves significantly in ways that are frequently maintained over time. <coughs> Affirming attitudes can make a substantial difference in outcomes which is suggested by the growing number of studies finding that students of color achieve at higher levels, attend school more regularly, feel more cared for in the classroom, and are less likely to be suspended when they have teachers of the same race. One recent study found that having at least one black teacher in third through fifth grades reduced a black student's probability of dropping out of school by 29%, and by 39% for low-income black boys. Hmm. I want to see more details on that because that's a 10% difference on what seems like the same uh, <laughs> population. <coughs> The odds of both boys and girls planning to attend college are increased sharply. Also increased sharply. Oh, okay, so 29%. Uh, uh, okay, okay, so this is what it's saying. One recent study found that having at least one black teacher in third through fifth grades reduced a black student's probability of dropping out of school by 29%. That's both boys and girls. And by 39% for low-income black boys, meaning... I don't know, well, let's assume that, of course, it's male and female that they are uh, uh, talking about. That would mean that um, low-income black boys themselves have a 10% increase from the average, which, be t which would be 29%, which would mean for girls, you'd expect that to be, depending on if it's 50-50 classrooms, for girls, you would expect that to be uh, 19%, which actually isn't. I. It would also just depend on whether or not boys or girls are dropping out more. That 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 is not a very detailed or or. It doesn't have. There, there aren't enough. There's not enough information in this. A paragraph or, or a statement to really mean very much, but that actually is really cool. All teachers can convey affirming attitudes by exposing students to an intellectually demanding curriculum and supporting them in mastering it, conveying their confidence that students can learn, teaching students strategies they can use to monitor and manage their own learning encouraging children to excel, and building on the individual and cultural resources they bring to the school, ranging from the social knowledge of the community and its history to mathematically rich pastimes such as chess, 
and sports to expressive understanding of language use and popular culture. Strategies that convey respect and concern for students become the basis for meaningful relationships and positive academic results. These elements of an identity-safe classroom promote student achievement and, and attachments to school. In addition to the cultivating the classroom features already described, teachers who create identity-safe settings cultivate diversity as a resource for teaching through regular use of materials, ideas, and teaching activities that draw on reference to a wide range of cultures and exhibit high expectations for all students. Creating an identity-safe classroom by engaging in culturally responsive pedagogy relies on teachers understanding the views and experiences children bring to school including, for example, how students communicate in their communities, suggests that such teaching uses the cultural knowledge, prior experiences, frames of reference, and performance styles of ethnically diverse students to make learning encounters more relevant to and effective for them. It teaches to and through the strengths of these students. Developing classroom practices that capitalize on the funds of knowledge that are abundant in children's households and communities. This approach counters the deficit narrative of poor children with little social capital by recognizing and building upon the wealth of knowledge and repertoires of practice that exist in children's families and extended social networks. So the deficit narrative of poor children with little social capital. I'd want to read more into that as well. Another 2003 study. Because I'm not entirely sure what they're talking about here. This recognition can support stronger student learning. As one example, a recent study of teachers of Latino students found that teachers' beliefs and, uh, and reported behaviors about the role of Spanish in instruction, use of students' funds of knowledge, and teachers' own critical awareness were positively related to students' reading outcomes. For teachers reporting the highest level of each dimension, reading gains were significantly higher at the end of the year. 0.85 SD for those who valued Spanish, 0 0.60 SD. Oh, standard. That's not standard deviation. For those students, uh, for those using students' funds of knowledge and 1.70 SD for those who exhibit a critical awareness. Practices and dispositions associated with culturally responsive pedagogy include A, recognizing students' culturally grounded experiences as a foundation on which to build knowledge, b. Culturally com cultural competency in interacting with students and families, c. An ethic of deep care and affirming views of students, and d. A sense of efficacy about learning and creating uh, changes to promote equity that is consciously transmitted to students. When teachers view students' experiences as an asset and intentionally bring students' voices into the classroom, they create a safe and engaging atmosphere for learning to take place. Teachers can learn about the strengths and needs of students, as well as their families' funds of knowledge through regular check-ins and class meetings, conferencing, journaling, close observation of students and their work, and connections to parents as partners. These practices can foster trust and alignment among students, parents, and staff, as described in the following section. Practices to strengthen relational trust and family engagement. What am I doing on time? Oh.
Recent research shows that relational trust among teachers, parents, and school leaders is a key resource for schools that predicts the likelihood of gains in achievement and other student outcomes, where instructional expertise is, is also present. Trust derives from an understanding of one another's goals and efforts, along with a sense of mutual obligation grounded in a common mission. As Bryken Schneider <coughs> put it, relational trust constitutes the connective tissue that binds individuals together around advancing the education and welfare of children. They identify five features that foster relational trust, including one, small school size that fosters interpersonal relationships, two, stable school communities, three, voluntary associations where there is at least some choice for staff and students, four, skillful school leaders, who actively listen to concerns of all party, parties and avoid arbitrary actions, and five, authentic parent engagement grounded in partnerships with families to promote student growth. Principals can nurture relational trust among staff members by creating time for staff collaboration, <clears throat> focused on curriculum planning and school improvement, supporting teachers' growth and development through asset-based feedback and learning systems, distributing leadership for many functions throughout the school, and involving staff in decision making. These practices have been found to retain teachers in schools, contributing to staff stability and to increase teaching eff uh, effectiveness and gains in student achievement. <clears throat> Schools can nurture strong staff-parent relationships by building in time and supports for teachers and advisors to engage parents as partners with valued expertise, by planning teacher time for home visits, <coughs> positive phone calls home, school meetings, and student-teacher-parent conferences scheduled flexibly around parents' availability and regular exchanges between home and school. Jeez, we are in desperate need of that sort of stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Building strong relationships between the school and the family increases academic outcomes for students. In a series of meta-analyses examining the impact of parent involvement, Jane's found consistent positive effects of parent involvement on academic achievement for children from pre-K through 12th grade. A meta-analysis of 51 studies found an effect size of 0.3 for a broad population of urban students. Another meta-analysis of 28 st studies found parent involvement associated with better school outcomes for Latino students. The largest effect sizes were for programs that encouraged parents to engage in shared reading with their children, including strategies in which teachers offered questions <clears throat> that parents could ask about the readings, those that involved parents and teachers working together as partners to develop common strategies, rules, guidelines, and expectations for children those that increased communication between parents and teachers, and those that involved parents in checking students' homework. Similarly, similarly, the Consortium on Chicago School Research found parent involvement a key component of 100 Chicago elementary schools with steep improvements in achievement. Controlling for other variables, students were 10 times more likely to achieve substantial gains in mathematics and have increased student motivation and participation in schools with strong parental involvement. <clears throat> in a research synthesis of 51 studies that included experimental, quasi-experimental, and correlational studies 
with statistical controls, Henderson and Mapp found that schools that succeeded in engaging families from diverse backgrounds focused on building trusting relationships where power and responsibility are shared. They found lasting effects on achievement when students feel supported both at home and in school. Students with involved parents have more self-confidence, feel school is more important, earn higher grades, and attend college. In a, long, in a longitudinal study conducted in 71 Title I elementary schools, higher achievement was stimulated by teacher outreach to parents through face-to-face -face meetings, sending materials home, and phone calls home on a routine basis. The overall effect size between parent involvement and students' academic achievement was approximately 0.3. Other research finds that African American youth's experiences of their families' support for, the, for them, sense of control over their own academic outcomes, and their feelings of self-worth and emotional security, in part a result of positive racial socialization, predict their engagement in school beyond the influence of SES. They keep bringing up these acronyms without explaining what they are, <clears throat> which is not very professional. Creating strong, respectful relationships among families and staff can create the resonance and coherence between home and school that reaps long-term benefits for students' learning. Summary. In sum, <clears throat> in sum, Schools can support student development by creating structures that enable teachers to know their students well and develop strong relationships, ranging from smaller classes and school units to advisory systems, looping teaching teams, and longer grade spans. Teachers can create classroom communities in which students are affirmed, enabled to belong, and taught social responsibility and schools can involve families as partners, aligning home and school practices and capitalizing on their cultural assets. These multiple approaches to developing strong relationships promote the trust, safety, and sense of belonging necessary for students' productive engagement in all aspects of school. Productive Instructional Strategies Having created a supportive environment for learning, what are the curriculum designs, instructional approaches, and assessment practices that will enable students to deeply understand disciplinary content and develop skills that will allow them to solve complex problems, communicate effectively, and ultimately manage their own learning? What the science of learning and development tells us. Modern learning theory emphasizes the, the situated and social nature of meaning making, by which mind, behavior, perception, and action are wholly integrated. <coughs> Children are natural learners and inherently seek to learn things that matter in their immediate everyday world. To support children, children's learning, adults make connections between new situations and familiar ones, focus children's attention, structure experiences, and organize the information children receive, while helping them develop strategies for intentional learning and problem solving. The science of learning indicates that humans learn more effectively when they are not anxious, fearful, or distracted by other pressing concerns. When the learning is connected to their prior knowledge and experience, when they are actively engaged, when they have a reason to care about the content they are learning and can use it to deepen their understanding and to solve real questions or problems. Finally, as Cantor and colleagues note, there is no single ideal developmental pathway for everyone. Instead, there are multiple pathways to healthy development, learning, academic success, and resilience. The NRC's report on how people learn, whoa, I might have to pause for a second. Okay, I'm back. 
The NRC's report on how people learn outlines three fundamental principles of learning that are particularly important for teaching. One, students come to the classroom with prior knowledge that must be addressed if teaching is to be effective. Students are not tabula rasa, blank slates. If what they know and believe is not engaged, learners may fail to grasp the new concepts and information that are taught, or they may learn them superficially, but not be able to apply them elsewhere. <coughs> this means that teachers need to understand that what students are thinking and how to connect with them prior, with their prior knowledge if they are to ensure learning. Students come to school with different experiences, so they present distinct preconceptions, knowledge bases, cultural and linguistic capital that teachers should learn about and take into account in designing instruction. Successful teachers provide careful de carefully designed scaffolds to help students take each step in, in the learning journey with appropriate assistance. These vary for different students depending on their learning needs, approaches, and prior knowledge. Teachers' success with diverse learners is enhanced by their ability to address students' different ways of lear learning, knowing, and communicating. <clears throat> Two, students need to organize and use knowledge conceptually if they are to apply it beyond the classroom. To develop competence in an area of inquiry, students need to understand facts and ideas in the context of a conceptual framework so that they can organize knowledge in ways that facilitate its application. This means that teachers should structure the material to be learned in ways that help students fit it into a conceptual map and teach it in ways that allow application and transfer to new situations. The teaching strategies that allow students to do this uh, to do this integrate carefully designed direct instruction with hands-on inquiries that actively engage students in using the material. <clears throat> incorporate problem solving, uh, incorporate problem solving of increasing complexity, and assess students' understanding for the purpose of guiding instruction and student revisions of their work. Three. Students learn more effectively if they understand how they learn and how to manage their own learning. A metacognitive approach to instruction can help students take control of their own learning using a set of personalized learning strategies, defining their own learning goals, and monitoring their progress in achieving them. <clears throat> Teachers need to know how to help students self-assess their understanding and how they best approach learning. Through modeling and coaching, teachers can teach students how to use a range of learning strategies, including the ability to activate background knowledge, plan ahead, and apportion time and memory, to create explanations in order to improve understanding and to note confusion or failures to comprehend, as well as to evaluate their own work, seek out additional insight, and revise and improve it. In what follows, we use these three principles to organize this section on curriculum, instruction, and assessment. <clears throat> and we infuse additional insights from research grounded in a sociocultural perspective, including a section on motivation. While enormously helpful in synthesizing knowledge from the learning sciences up to that point, the How People Learn report did not fully examine the sociocultural context of learning and the, soci the social emotional factors affecting it. <clears throat> the National Academy of Sciences is currently producing a second edition of How People Learn intended to address these issues. Among these additional insights are that students' beliefs and perceptions about intelligence and ability both generally and in relation to themselves personally, affects their cognitive functioning, confidence, and learning. These perceptions can be shaped by teachers' and peers' expectations, statements, and behaviors. 
while negative emotions like anxiety and distress can block learning, emotion also triggers uh, learning as it affects excitement and attention, and thus should be considered in designing instruction that is mentally engaging. At the same time, consistent structures, supports, and affirmations that allow the student to know what to expect and how to be successful reduce cognitive load and free up the mind for learning other challenging materials. Finally, as we have noted, there are different kinds of learning which call for different kinds of teaching. Educational goals increasingly emphasize the problem solving and, inter and interpersonal skills needed for 21st century success, which cannot be developed through passive, rote oriented uh, learning focused on the memorization of disconnected facts. Today's goals require paths to deeper understanding, supporting the transfer of skills and use of knowledge in new situations. Principles of for practice. With these goals and insights in mind, the science of learning and development suggests the following principles for instructional practice. One, should teaching should build on and expand children's prior knowledge and experiences, both to scaffold learning effectively as it expands to new areas of content and skills and to inform practices that are individually and culturally responsive. Given what each child is ready to learn, teachers should structure appropriately challenging activities that balance what a child already knows with what he wants and needs to learn, while introducing other rich experiences to support ongoing learning. <clears throat> Two, teaching should support conceptual understanding, engagement, and motivation by designing relevant problem-oriented tasks that combine explicit instruction about key ideas, organized around a conceptual map or schema of the domain being taught with well-designed inquiry opportunities that use multiple modalities for learning. Three, to enable students to manage their own learning and transfer it to new contexts Teaching should be designed to develop students' metacognitive capacity, agency, and the capacity for strategic learning. This requires opportunities for self-direction, goal-setting, and planning, and formative assessment with regular opportunities for reflection on learning strategies and outcomes, feedback, and revision of work. Building on and expanding children's knowledge and experiences. Jean Piaget was the first student of learning to lay out a set of developmental stages that he observed children move through as independent learners. This concept of development was fairly static, suggesting that students uh, would be ready for certain kinds of learning at certain ages. For example, However, Russian teacher and psychologist Lev Vygotsky recognized that individual capacities develop in social contexts where they are supported, shaped by learning and cultural exchanges, and that experiences can influence what children are ready to learn, especially when they have the help of a more of a more expert other of a more expert other within their zone of proximal development. Furthermore, experiencing a sense of disequilibrium in light of new situations or unfamiliar ideas can trigger the need to resolve puzzlement through exploration, which itself sparks more learning, especially when the right supports are in place to help the student make a meaning of what he or she is experiencing. The learning sciences point to the importance of one teaching students within the zone of proximal development and scaffolding their learning so that they can advance to more complex skills. Two, drawing in students' prior experiences. Three, creating a rich environment for learning, including opportunities <clears throat> for collaboration with others, which expand the range of experiences 
uh, each can encounter. And four, providing cognitive supports. We treat each of these in the following sections. Teaching and scaffolding in the zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development represents the learning space between what a child can do in a particular area on his or her own and what he or she can do with some assistance from more capable peers, teachers, and others. <coughs> Children internalize the help they receive from others, which becomes part of their repertoire to guide future problem solving. Well-designed instruction helps nudge the child to a new level of understanding within the zone of proximal development by providing the right kind of experiences and supports. This scaffolding refers to the guidance that allows students to, to more readily master a task that is beyond their existing skill set or knowledge base. <coughs> Scaffolding includes both affect, affective and co cognitive elements. In addition to providing assistance and timely feedback, scaffolding involves communicating reassurance, helping students understand the habits of mind necessary to become proficient, and helping students understand the tasks, re the tasks' relevance and how their personal trajectory toward competence could unfold. So the interesting thing here is the zone of proximal development, at least as I have learned it, is not really, I mean, this makes perfect sense with the way that I've learned it, but the way I learned it was more similar to the Yerkes-Dodson uh, Yerkes graph, where it's like the amount of effort required is not like minimal, but it's not maximal either but it's not in the middle, it's not like centered. It's a little more than what you're comfortable with and familiar with, even though it's a subject area that you're interested in and have maybe a little bit of mastery in, but it's pushing that mastery beyond your comfortable limits to the point where it's uh, causing a little bit of stress, but this is good stress. <clears throat> Too much of that stress then uh, leads to uh, leads one out of the zone of proximal development, but it makes a lot of sense that this zone of proximal development would also be right outside the boundaries of the person's um, what they're proficient in in themselves, which means they need to seek answers either in creative ways or from other people or in whatever way they seek those answers. So that's uh, interesting, really interesting way to put it. Children's developmental and learning trajectories vary as a, pro um, as a product of the interactions of their attributes and social contexts, as well as over time. Furthermore, each student functions within multiple zones of development that vary from one domain to the next. A student may need one kind of assistance as she completes a long division problem and yet another kind of assistance as she writes a short story. Careful observation, questioning, assessment of work, and one-on-one -on -one interaction with students provides the kinds of information teachers need to determine what level and type of assistance a student may need to advance in his or her understanding. Drawing on students' prior experiences. Part of successful teaching is learning what students already know where they already demonstrate competence, and how they can bring that knowledge into the classroom context. As Nasir and colleagues point out, often people can competently perform complex cognitive tasks outside of school, but may not display these skills on school-type tasks, or their displays might not be recognized as demonstrating competence according to normative standards based on assumptions that those who differ from middle-class norms operate at a deficit. For example, complex statistical calculations used on the basketball court may not initially carry into the mathematics class unless teachers are alert to support the transfer by building on this kind of real-world knowledge. <coughs> 
as Lee demonstrated, a bridge between students' experiences and, and school content can be built by using a cultural modeling approach that draws on the familiar to make the structure of a domain visible and explicit to students. Lee illustrated symbolic meanings in literature by beginning with rap songs and texts the students knew and carried their insights into study of more formal canonic texts. Similarly, Bowler's study of the outcomes of inquiry-based instructional practices in mathematics classrooms serving low-income students found that linguistic, ethnic, and class inequalities were reduced when teachers contextualized problems and made them relevant to students' lives, introducing new concepts through discussion and asking students to explain and discuss their thinking. These teachers achieved stronger outcomes by seeking to understand and support students' thinking and inquiry in the context of rich collaborative learning experiences, rather than narrowing the curriculum to rote-oriented algorithms, as often happens for students who have had less prior experience with the content. A broader body of research has documented similar strategies for building classroom communities that support successful mathematics learning. <clears throat> In addition to building on students' prior knowledge, teachers may also need to confront prior knowledge to address mis misconceptions. In the area of historical thinking, for example, studies reveal that young people come to historical topics with experiences and encounters developed outside of the classroom through media or their families' accounts of historical events. Thus, teachers need to surface students' beliefs and judgments while helping them develop skills for evidence-based inquiry. Curriculum that teaches students to interrogate and use primary source documents builds on expert studies of historians' practices and helps teachers guide whole class discussions and design inquiry projects that are appropriate for younger readers with less background knowledge. <clears throat> Creating rich collaborative environments for learning. As the aforementioned examples illustrate, learning abilities are developed by access to rich experiences that stimulate the brain. One of the earliest studies on the effect of the environment on brain development was the work of William Greenow and his colleagues, who compared the brains of rats raised in complex environments containing toys and obstacles with those housed individually in small cages without toys. This is actually the uh, um, the experiment that I was referencing uh, yesterday when I was talking about IQ, but they've done this experiment, well, the quasi-experiment on people too, um, where they took certain orphaned children and, and um, let's say they took certain, they, they didn't take the children, but they followed orphaned children that went into, let's say, rich environments as they're about to talk about and saw their development and then orphan children from the same orphanage who either uh, didn't go into an environment like they stayed in the orphanage or they were, um, uh, I don't even think you can adopt if you are not like at least middle class. So basically they became the control group and well, the same thing happens as with these rats and we'll see. They found that rats raised in complex environments performed better on learning tasks, liked learning to run mazes, and had 20 to 25 percent more synapses per neuron in the visual cortex. Many studies since have shown that brain development is experience dependent. <clears throat> Rich environments that support brain development provide numerous opportunities for social interactions, direct physical contact, contact with the environment, and a changing set of objects for exploration. Similarly, rich classroom environments provide interactions with others in the classroom and community, 
hands-on experiences with the physical world, and frequent informative feedback on what students are doing and thinking. Ted Pollan's classroom, described at the beginning of this article, is a good example of such an environment, with different work areas for different kinds of activities, a rich assortment of readily accessible books, blocks, and other manipulatives, a physical timeline overhead with historical date cards, frequently added, regularly used posters reminding students of how to engage in various reading and writing activities, and opportunities for collaboration with, with other students. Ted's classroom also illustrates how teachers can set up instructional conversations that support student learning. Vygotsky noted, that learning scientists have since demonstrated that social interactions using language in support of thinking enable more strategic learning. Neuroscientists have also demonstrated that the development of neural pathways is associated with exposure to a generation of language. Students sharpen their thinking as they converse about their reasoning and inquire into what they don't yet understand. When they are also able to articulate concepts, use them in a task, see or hear other models of thinking, and get feedback, they learn more deeply. <clears throat> Substantial research identifies benefits of social learning in well-managed groups, and the capacity to work well in groups is an increasingly valued outcome of schooling. Collaborative learning is an important classroom tool that can be used to, to provide students with learning assistance from peers within their zone of proximal development. Opportunities to articulate their ideas and opportunities to develop metacognitive skills like self-regulation and executive function. As they learn to manage, manage themselves to, to interact productively with others and seek out help from teachers and peers, these skills are both exhibited and developed through social processes that teachers foster. Cooperative small group learning is one of the most studied pedagogical interventions in educational research. With hundreds of studies and many meta-analyses, finding significant achievement benefits for students when they work together on learning activities. For example, a meta-analysis of 158 studies, 70% of which involved random assignment, demonstrated that cooperative learning promotes higher achievement compared to individualistic efforts. Effect sizes range from 0.18 at the low end and uh, to 1.03 for the most impactful program. In addition to cognitive gains, a review of 36 studies using experimental or quasi-experimental designs found positive outcomes of collaborative learning on measures such as student self-concept, social interaction, time on task, and liking of one's peers, as well as academic outcomes with moderate effect sizes. Researchers have identified a number of social processes that help to explain <coughs> My small group work supports individual learning. These include opportunities to share original insights, resolve differing perspectives through argument, explain one's thinking about a phenomenon, provide critique, observe the strategies of others, and listen to explanations. There's evidence that collaborators can generate st strategies and abstract problem representations that are extremely unlikely to be observed when individuals work alone, suggesting that there are unique benefits of joint thinking. While well-managed group work can enhance student learning, it requires group-worthy tasks <clears throat> in which all must engage for the work to be successfully accomplished, support for students to learn to work together, and sophisticated questioning and scaffolding skills on the part of teachers. For example, in complex instruction classrooms, a much researched approach that uses cooperative learning to teach at a high academic level using carefully constructed interdependent group tasks, students are taught to undertake different roles. 
for instance, materials manager, timekeeper, task minder, and others. To support productive collaboration, the teacher orchestrates tasks, relationships, and supports and disrupts status hierarchies that might develop based on students' personalities, developed abilities, language backgrounds, or other factors. That's interesting. I really want to know how that one normally goes. I think the implication is it works pretty well. I guess giving people who are not normally accustomed to being on the leading side and vice versa to uh, have the opportunity to try it out and gain those skills, becoming a more well-rounded person. That seems to be the implication. Teachers equalize interactions between high and low status students by structuring tasks to help them recognize and use their multiple abilities. As students draw on different competencies to accomplish a group task, Teachers can also assign competence to a student by recognizing the student's contributions to the group task through public statements, conferring a positive evaluation on the student's effort, thus boosting participation of low-status students without restraining the participation of high-status students. These moves produce strong learning gains and reduce achievement gaps among student groups. In successful use of cooperative approaches, teachers often help students structure roles within the group and provide questions and tasks that guide the group's discussion. For example, in a review of 94 studies which focused on the conditions for high-quality discussion in science teams, the author concluded that a successful stimulus for students working in small groups to enhance their understanding of evidence has two elements. One requires students, students to generate their individual prediction, model, or hypothesis, which they then debate in their small group. The second element requires them to test, compare, revise, or develop that jointly with further data provided. Teachers play an active role in constructing the tasks and questions that help students learn to coordinate their work and frame their ideas in terms that reflect the modes of inquiry in the discipline. These efforts support the development of social, cognitive, and academic skills, while also developing student agency and the ability to reflect on and evaluate ideas. Providing cognitive support. Teachers can also support student learning by being aware of how cognitive development unfolds. At the heart of all learning is meaning making that involves connecting what we already know to new information. The central role of background knowledge is well documented in cognitive research. As just one example, research on reading has long demonstrated that comprehension depends on prior knowledge about the topic that permits sense making as much as it does on de decoding skills. When students have not had particular experiences or have not acquired certain kinds of background knowledge, teachers can in fact create experiences for them to develop that knowledge. The kind of classroom described above, which constructs rich, uh, rich experiences for students and provides extensive information on the topics that are the subject of deep inquiry, helps to do that. One way to build background knowledge is to ensure a broad curriculum in history social studies, science, and the arts, as well as reading and math, and engage students in field trips as educators have long advocated. Finally, teachers can set the stage with information regarding the context and topics of a shared text before they begin with the students. The fact that background knowledge is important for higher level problem solving does not mean that basic skills must be taught by rote before children engage in inquiry. In fact, allowing for discovery and exploration can help set the stage for explicit instruction. In an approach called Inventing to Prepare for Future Learning, Bradford and Schwartz found that posing challenges to learners 
and introducing inquiries into questions created more contextualized understanding and ultimately led to better recall and use of information presented later than did approaches that simply taught novices the relevant facts or formulas. Teachers can also support student learning by providing strategies and tools that reduce cognitive load and free the mind's attention for higher order thinking and problem solving. Cognitive load theory addresses techniques for managing working memory load in order to facilitate the learning of complex cognitive tasks. <clears throat> working memory is our capacity to simultaneously keep in mind multiple pieces of information and it is highly influenced by how information is perceived and connected to concepts, schemas, and scripts that are already familiar. These forms of background knowledge influence what is noticed, how easily new knowledge can be kept in mind and previous information remembered. Prior knowledge allows for a cognitive process referred to as chunking, reducing a larger set of items into smaller units that allow for pattern recognition and fit within the constraints of working memory. These uh, teachers can support learning by chunking information in manageable ways and supporting students to become proficient in the use of new material by attaching ideas to one another and to a common schema of the domain under study that makes the material more meaningful rather than asking students to remember disconnected pieces of information, and by giving students opportunities to practice skills so that they become automatic, freeing up bandwidth for new materials and more complex applications. <coughs> Educators can also help students reduce cognitive load to free up their minds for problem solving by using tools for adapting to working memory limitations. From using notes to digital tools such as calculators or computers that can be used to offload computational or memory heavy tasks during problem solving sessions. This view of cognitive casts, uh, this view of cognition casts intelligence as distributed among minds, material artifacts, cultural tools, and interacting partners. In the classroom we visited at the beginning of this article, the teacher, Ted, had worked with students to create many memory assists that were posted all over the classroom, posters illustrating fractions, problems the classroom had tackled and solved, a classroom constitution with shared norms, the rules of book club, the definitions of figurative language, a writing workshop conferencing protocol, poetry guidelines, persuasive essays, jobs in a reading conference, enumerated for both the student and the teacher, elements of a news magazine article, what we know about maps, and multiplying two digit by one digit numbers, the traditional algorithm. These were often in the student's own words, codifying their learning so that so they could share it and go back to it as needed. All of these both help to reduce cognitive load and support student independence and confidence in building on their prior learning. In light of the need for students to learn to find, curate, and use information rather than just remember it, educators can help students learn to use tools that improve their performance. Furthermore, assistive technologies such as audiobooks, electronic readers that can adjust the size and type of font, Recording tools, dictation strategies, and other supports can help students with particular kinds of disabilities in working memory, auditory, or visual processing become successful in managing their learning and developing their performance capabilities, rather than suffering from deficit frameworks that limit the advances they can make. Pedagogies are ways to coordinate cognitive processes and systems. For example, Learning to read requires developing the capacity to decode text, which in turn is facilitated by earlier phrases, by earlier phases of language development that involve hearing words in meaningful contexts and understanding that they can correspond to written symbols. 
working memory, background knowledge, and opportunities for elaboration all come into play as children work to develop both decoding and strategies for meaning making. For meaning making. Research on reading makes it clear that both explicit instruction in decoding and immersion in meaningful, interesting, and varied texts are needed to become fluent in reading, along with sustained engagement with a larger community of readers who support skills and interest development. Learning how to make strategic meaning of the text is centrally important, as readers use reading clues and background knowledge to make sense of text and the knowledge of others in their community, they are also acquiring more background knowledge for the future from the text and their peers. Similarly, learning is supported by techniques that lead to the elaboration of material, such as self-explanation, peer teaching, and representing information in multiple mod modalities. These deepen conceptual understanding, strengthen mental models, and improve the capacity to recall and use information. In mathematics, for example, asking students to represent quantitative information in multiple forms, such as with graphs and verbal explanations, can support robust understanding. More generally, asking students to integrate abstract concepts and concrete examples in their explanations can deepen their comprehension while simultaneously providing richer data to teachers for assessment. Specific pedagogical moves that support these learning processes include choices of tasks that have the right amount of challenge with supportive guidance, well-chosen questions as scaffolds that support student thinking, guide their inquiry, and help them consolidate their understanding. Use of multiple and varied representations of concepts that allow students to hook into understanding in different ways. Design of instructional conversations that allow students to discuss their thinking and hear other ideas, developing concepts, language, and further questions in the process. Encouragement for students to elaborate, question, and self-explain. Instruction and curriculum that use apprentice-style relationships in which knowledgeable practitioners or older peers facilitate students' ever deeper participation in a particular field or domain. <clears throat> I think I'm going to stop there on this one. I think, uh, yeah, so far I, I'm really enjoying this article. It's really interesting. Um, let's see. One thing that I've learned from this, not really learned, but it's more cemented my understanding just a little bit, is, is how well these peer groups, or, or how important these peer groups are for these students. Like, it's not really about the individual just sort of coming up with all of the solutions, although the individual does actually play an important part, but it's more about these team building exercises that help build a, a peer support system that allow these people to really excel much, or these children to really excel much further than let's say they would on their own. And this is especially important for um, children of mar marginalized or low income communities. So let's say children who don't really feel all that supported by their, by their um, general society. <clears throat> uh, one thing that I was thinking of is, I don't know if this has been studied, but one really important thing for learning outcomes is the development of a goal, a particular learning goal. For instance, I'm studying so that I can become a clinical psychologist one day. I'm learning about this because it's generally proximal to 
clinical psychology. It's talking about development and how you can get people who otherwise wouldn't really want to learn, um, get them more interested in learning. And, and so, oh, and another really important thing I learned is it's really important to connect learning to their experience in some way that they can use it. But I say that because it's really interesting. And this is something that I was thinking of. What would, how do I put this? What would it be like if we had a student from a very young age decide what they want to be, you know, sort of um, like, like set their own goal for themselves? And then we build a curriculum around that. And so it's like typically what we see in primary school right now is, well, you have to learn these four uh, fundamental topics. Okay, well, what if instead of framing it that way, because kids don't know how those relate, just say, okay, well, you want to be a video game designer? Sounds good. That needs, you, you need some computer knowledge, you need some team building knowledge, you need some uh, artistic skill. You need to know a little bit of the history of art. But on top of that, if you're going to be designing for, let's say, Americans, you need to know a little bit about American, uh, the American mythos that will speak to these people and possibly to you if you're going to be um, marketing this or um, designing a video game that would be more worldwide. You need to know a little bit about world history if you're going to be designing these things, you'll need to know a bit about math, a bit about science. And instead of framing it like these are the four basic topics you need to know in order to function in society, which most kids don't really like that doesn't connect with them. It's like, OK, yeah, this broad ephemeral concept society. OK, whatever. I want to play and have uh, some fun with my friends. But I remember when I was 10, for instance. I really wanted to design video games. And I didn't really know what all was entailed in that. And if school was marketed to me as, and the curriculum was specifically structured for me, like, okay, you want to learn how to do video games first. Uh, the, the prerequisite for that is you got to know the art a couple art forms and digital media and um, how computers basically work. Prerequisite for that is you need to know um, a bit about math, algebra, um, computation. Um, a prerequisite for that is you need to know numbers and the basics of math. So we're going to start you in the basics of math. And then when you're finished with that and you understand it, then you can move up. Imagine the motivation for that for me as a kid. And what if we did that for other kids? A kid wants to be an astronaut. Okay, well, you can do it, kid. Now, in order to be an astronaut, the prerequisite is, well, first, you got to be fit. Second, you got to know a little bit about these physics that you'll be um, putting yourself into. And so you go all the way down the line. Now, the first step to being an astronaut is learn one plus one. You learn one plus one, great. You're one step closer to becoming an astronaut. And just move that upwards. Now that's something, it seems sort of straightforward to me, but I, I would really want to see if they've done studies on that. And if not, if they could, that'd be really cool. Maybe I could one of these days, but got to take that first step first, I guess. Okay, thanks for joining me. And uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, let me know in the comments. Bye.